All right, welcome to the show, guys. Today we have on Tom Patry. He is the president slash founder of TP Golf Services, where they help teach and train some of uh, the world's foremost golf pros. Uh, the purpose of this interview is to see how um, a he built his business and b just to talk about golf and and the future of golf and go the golf business in general. Tom, welcome to the show. David, pleasure to be with you tonight. So let's let's start from uh, let's start from some of the pros that you've that you helped help to teach. Uh, what are some of the guys that uh, we would we would think of that have been under your tutelage? Uh, David, the two that come to mind are probably the most um, well known to, the, to your public are uh, Severiano Ballesteros, who unfortunately passed away recently at too young of an age, and uh, Ben Crenshaw. So I mean. Two-time Masters champion. Those guys are both. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with during my career. Um, obvious ones, and I spent a good deal of my time in the '90s on the ladies' tour and worked with four or five gals out there. That went out there, so I've uh, I've been pretty blessed to be around some pretty talented people. Now, take us back to the beginning. When did you first? Well, maybe not. Maybe not first. So, how did you get into golf? <laughs> and actually. My accent. My uh, my dad was in the rush business, David, and, and um, wound up running a public golf facility on the east end of Long Island um, in the uh, food and beverage department. And uh, between my uh, fourth and fifth grade years, he moved us onto the property at this club, uh, which was a 27-hole daily fee uh, public golf course. And at the time, in that area of Long Island, which is you know better part of 35, 40 years ago. There was, there was not much housing in that area. It was just kind of out in the middle of nowhere at that time. And uh, one day an 11-year-old boy woke up and, and there was this golf course outside. He'd never even seen or heard of golf. So um, I believe life has many forks in the road. That was one of the forks in my road and uh, obviously a very important one. So you... <laughs> I'm laughing because I can imagine just uh, a, a young kid just... Yeah, really. Imagine an 11 years old waking up one day and there's this golf course outside your window, your bedroom window, and you'd never even seen or heard of golf. I mean, not not one speck, had no exposure, didn't know what it was, didn't even existed. And you wake up this one morning and there's this golf course outside. It's a truth. Uh, as an 11 year old, it was kind of like an adventure. It was, it was fun, and uh, I was pretty much, you know, pretty much hooked instantly. I was intrigued by it. So how did you how did you jump in? How did you just build the love for it? It even gets even crazier because what happened was obviously not knowing anything about it. Obviously didn't have any equipment. Father was not a golfer. He was, he was like I said, a food and beverage guy. Um, in the parking lot of the club one day, I don't forget the ones I did. I found I found a Sam Seed Blue Ridge Wilson five iron that somebody had obviously now realized broken over their knee probably in anger. I had broken it off exactly the right length and you slipped a new grip on it, it would be perfect for an 11 year old boy. Wow. So we put a grip on the end of that club and, and, and the little Tommy Patrick went off to the driving range and started beating the golf balls. Wow. <laughs> and you know, kids are always kind of monkey see, monkey do, watch the guy next to you and try to take a swipe at it. And I'll, I'll, this is incredible, I remember this, I think, David, but I remember that first day. Just by pure action, caught one golf ball right in the middle of the club face and hit it pure up in the air. It went quite a ways, and, and, and that feeling was kind of like a drug, and, and uh, I, I was then hooked and started. Okay, so take us take us through uh, high school and college. How You just stop. Yeah, go, so, go ahead. I, I start playing, and, and obviously I'm working for my dad in the restaurant at the club and saving my, saving my pennies and... Uh, I buy a used set of ladies golf clubs, and uh, and now I'm off the races. Um, the pro at that club wasn't particularly fond of <laughs> wasn't particularly fond of junior golfers, so he had no interest in me. So I had to kind of fend for myself there a little bit, and uh, becoming pretty obsessive, I I read, watched, and uh, and and tried to emulate anybody who I thought was competent. Um, obviously, back then, no golf channel, no you know, no real uh, video technology like today. So again, it was like a monkey see, monkey do thing. I'll never forget. I uh, I played, I played my first junior golf tournament the following summer 
and I shot a sterling 133 strokes. And, but I played with a kid my same age who shot 76. And, and that was another kind of fork in the road because I looked at him and I said, well, if he can do that, I can do that. Why, why can't I be that good? It's impossible. He's that much better than me. So now the obsession took, took, took itself to a whole other level. And one year later, one year later in the exact same junior tournament, I shot 77 and won it. So I went from 133 to 77 in the calendar year. And now, now you're really off the race. Now you're really, you're really obsessed by the whole thing. And, uh, and I remember, I remember, uh, melting snow in the driving range tee during the winter with my, with my team to, to get grassy spot to dump. So, Jimmy which was the only team in the country, uh, still today, and then wound up getting a college scholarship, getting a college job with this school, Florida Southern College, uh, which has produced, you know, some of the good players, uh, Lee James and Marco Meek, uh, a few guys in the company we know of. And while there, I won a couple, you know, a couple more college events. There was a new first team All Americans twice and won the 1981 NCAA Division II National Championship. But because of that same team, five iron, it was stacked up over somebody's knee in the parking lot. So it was a, it's a very short, Synopsis of what went on there, but uh, you know, a lot of great things came from that that uh, fighting that golf club in the, in the parking lot that day. Wow. So, why are uh, not why, but uh, after your college success in golf, um, did you try to go pro? Did you try to be a PGA pro, or did you just? I did, David. Actually, I turned professional right after my uh, NCAA in my senior year. And back then, um, even, even the young players today on, on tour don't realize it, but even back then, which is not that long ago when you really think of it in, in grand terms, 1981, there was no web dot com tour, no, no, uh, no place to really play other than the PGA tour. So you try to develop yourself as a professional. You, you played in some godforsaken mini tour, satellite tour, uh, state opens. Um, I remember one year, uh, Buying my first new car, and one calendar year later, I had 135,000 miles on it because I drove to every godforsaken corner of the country, playing in, you know, the Iowa State Open, or you know, uh, you know Montana tour, or you know, you know Florida mini tours, or wherever you could find a place to play. There's some New, new England tournaments. Um, because if you didn't play the PGA tour, you weren't qualified. That's all you had. That's all you could do is, is find these. Um, God forsaken events in all corners of the earth playing. I played a little bit in Europe. Uh, I played on the South African tour in 1984 during the winter. Uh, all chasing the dream of finally getting to the PGA tour. Um, went to the PGA qualifying school, went to the European qualifying schools, made it to the finals over in Europe twice, and just chased my dream for about eight years. And so and I, I would, I wouldn't give that back to me. It was a great time. Hmm. So after eight years, when did you? When did you transition to what you do now? It, was it just like a moment, or did you see that hey, you know, I can help, I can, I can, I, I can explain and teach some of these things? It was actually not that way at all. Actually, after eight years, I was really frustrated because I'd gotten very, very close. Uh, the carrot had been dangled in front of my nose, and uh, you know, kind of one step away from from the uh, major leagues, if you will. If you put it in baseball terms, you know, I was a Triple A player, and I was I. I I was right there and I couldn't quite break through. And uh, I woke up one day, at right around age 30, and I, I realized I didn't want to be be someday a vagabond, still chasing my dream at 45 and, and just being second rate. I had a decision to make, and uh, through a very strange set of circumstances, I interviewed for a bunch of jobs on Wall Street, uh, a couple of jobs on Madison Avenue, um, and people wanted to use my golf talent in the sales field. And I really thought I kind of bastardized what I what I believe in and the game I loved. And I I turned all those offers down. And really by accident, I was uh, introduced to a man named John Kennedy, who uh, gave me my first teaching position at a place called Cold Spring Country Club on Long Island. And I, I didn't think I was qualified for the position, but he gave me a chance. Uh, and although the membership and the people I taught received me very very well immediately, which was which was very flattering, I really felt like. I wasn't very good at what I was doing. I was the kind of person who either wanted to be very, very good at something or not do it at all. 
So I started chasing information, and, and, and uh, I started chasing teachers that were well known and, and seeking out their counsel, um, and spent a pretty fair amount of my income uh, visiting with people and watching them um, at their craft, trying to get ideas about how I could become be a better communicator, a better understander, a better, a better uh, instructor, a better coach, a better mentor myself. Um, and I was uh, befriended during that process just by a man named Bill Schlossbach, who probably means nothing to the Dolphin public, but to the PGA members of America, one of our national awards is named after him. Uh, he was a former National Teacher of the Year, and he took me under his wing. Um, and we became very, very close friends. And, uh, he opened a lot of other doors to other instructors for me to, uh, to visit with. Uh, and probably if it wasn't for Bill, uh, again, my career would be very different. Bill, Bill Schlossbach and a man named John Kennedy, who later went on to become director of instruction at Westchester Country Club, and people will know that because it's a, it's a it's a one of the real grand icon clubs in this country. Uh, who gave me a job there as director of instruction? Those two gentlemen really turned my life on and uh, kind of put me on the map. If you so, what are some of the things that Bill taught you? Um, obviously, you were doing you were training and coaching people up uh, a little bit, what are some of the things, the finer points that he taught you that uh, resonated with you? Well, probably, probably one of the most important great things that Bill taught me was that I had to become my own instructor, that I had to develop develop my own style, and although I'd be influenced by a lot of different people, and I should expose myself to everybody out there that was, you know, that was constructed and talented, uh, that even though I visited some of the great, great instructors in the world during those years, uh, and was counseled by each and every one of them, um, but I had to go away and, and, and put my own my own stamp on it, if you will, and be my own presenter. Um, Bill always encouraged me to get the information, um, disseminate it, and then, and then kind of you know take what I wanted and, and, and inject it into my own style, and, and, and not be not be scared to throw things away. Um, and I, I was exposed to so many guys who came at golf and the golf swing from so many different angles. And perspectives that uh, it was a little overwhelming, quite frankly, at first. And as you matured and, and you watched things um, happen successfully in your own lesson team in front of you with people, you kind of, you know, over time developed your own style. That's why it's so, um, I don't want to say infuriating, but to me today, was people out there think they're going to walk out on the lesson tee, uh, you know, and, and be a success instantly because. Because they went to a uh, played college golf, or because they played in a couple of tournaments in their life, or something successful as a player. Teaching and coaching uh, a sport, a motor skill, um, is a maturation process. We take a deal of time and toil and energy and hands dirty in the trenches to develop the style and the communication ability to really impact people. It doesn't happen overnight. Mm. Now, it's always it's always great to hear uh, successful people talk about having a mentor. Um, so after after that period of time where he Bill took you under uh, his wing and you start to learn the ropes and you started to uh, advance, um, how did you transition into the the business the the company that you have now? That was uh, that was an evolution as well, David. That was uh, you know, I, I guess I'm pretty. I didn't know this obviously as probably a thirty year old, but uh, I guess by 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 lifestyle, I'm, I'm kind of entrepreneurial. Uh, and I, you know, so many guys in my business would teach during the season in New York, and then take the winter off. You know, they kind of you know, maybe put some tournaments during the winter, or you know, just download and recharge the battery during the winter. And I was the guy who said, you know, just to have the winter off. In New York, why can't I go to Florida and do something? Why can't I go south to Florida and do something? And uh, I started developing um, and, and running my own golf school during the winter. Uh, you know, how to find a site to do it, how to find a staff, uh, how to work from from create some kind of a business model so it could work, and then how to market it. And uh, again, Bill was there kind of to hold my hand a little bit at the beginning. Um, some else was originally. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it back in 93, 94, somewhere in uh, Vero Beach, Florida. We, 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 we contracted a site to do some things. And from that first winter, grew uh, 
out of that group, TP Golf Services, which we have, which I have today still, um, we've been uh, and counseled and, and mentored and, and coached and taught thousands of people over the last, uh, I guess, gone almost 20 plus years now, um, uh, all because of that beginning uh, idea of going to Florida during the winter and not taking them off. So I've, uh, I've kind of worked around the clock for the last uh, you know, 25 plus years now forming this business, and uh, and it's been fun. It's been a, it's been a great journey. Uh, Bill passed away uh, quite a while ago with a brain tumor. Uh, I miss him dearly. I miss his counsel dearly. Um, but so many things that he taught me, I put the practice and practice in the in growing this business out of those ideas. So how? This is more of a slightly technical question, but how how did you build up your business in, in general terms? I mean, obviously you're, a, you're you're teaching the game and you're networking, but how did you build up your business? You know, it, it's it's funny how you know they, they, so many people along the way helping. I mean, Bill obviously on the, on, the, on the technique side of the golf and uh, as a figure and, 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 and a mentor, but so many people that you come in contact with. Uh, when you have success, I think when you look back at success, if you're really honest with yourself, uh, and there's so many people that help you along the way. And uh, people, uh, obviously being at some of the clubs I've worked at, some great clubs, some very, very prestigious clubs, so many successful business people sat down and gave you ideas about, about the business side of, of, uh, of my sport. Um, but I remember, for example, a guy named Jeff Young, uh, in, the, in the middle of the was, was, was a sort of dear friend of mine. He had a pretty successful IT company, and said to me one day, he said, you know, Tom, you need a website. <laughs> I was, let's old and I said, website? Of course, I have websites. He was like, you have to have a website. Well, I didn't even know what a website was. I didn't know what it was supposed to do. He said, you're going to be glad you have this man, and it's going to be a website that has evolved and gone through uh, many, many changes and transitions and, and, and growth to what it is today. Uh, but I looked up about uh, 10 years after you told me that, about 45% of my winning business was coming through that website online. Mm. Uh, if, if I hadn't met Jeff Young and didn't love that website back then, I'm not sure if I'd be you nearly know, as successful. And then from that, he you know, said, you know, you should develop a newsletter and talk about, you know, online news, you know, newsletter techniques that I could use. And uh, we grew that newsletter from zero to about the uh, 50 and, uh, monthly. Uh, subscribers that newsletter right now. And then from there, some of you can just of social media, which I have no concept of. And, you know, we went from, in the last year, we went from zero to uh, 12,000 uh, followers on Twitter, uh, and a Facebook business page, you know, a LinkedIn situation, and, and on and on and on. So, you know, it's, it's been an aturation, it's been an evolution, it's been, uh, it's been many people guiding me and, and uh, helping me. Uh, but I think it's also been my having desire uh, to be not only a good teacher and coach, be uh, successful at what I do. And uh, in, 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 in that context of being successful, I've tried to share those ideas with as many people as I could. You know, I have a golf question coming up. You guys are on the social teaching business. Uh, you know, one of the only things Bill had asked me to do was. It was Sunday uh, when, when, you know, Sunday can go on for help, and I, I gave it to him. And I really tried to give that back. Hmm. Um, what, what, are, what is one of the, this is sort of a, a weird but uh, kind of hard question to ask. What are some of or one thing that you love to teach? Um, is it when, uh, your your student understands a concept. Is it when your student gets that you know the light turns on? What what are some of the things that as you're teaching uh, the game that just by experiencing it, seeing it, like motivates you? You know that's a that's a wonderful question, Dave. I think one of the things that I, I, I learned from Bill uh, and that's the he really taught me that I watched it occur and was that. Uh, he was a man who was, was passionate about teaching the game 
and got as much of a charge from seeing somebody do something mm-hmm. successfully in front of him as I was in my past as a player, getting a good shot of winning a golf tournament. He, um, he really got a charge of somebody having success uh, with their golf game, it, whether it be the tour player, the club, the club member, a junior golfer. Uh, anybody seeking his counsel, he saw them being successful with their motor school activity. It really gave him a good feeling, and he got took a lot of gratification from that. And, and I, you know, I didn't think after I stopped my playing career, if I'd ever feel uh, as passionate about something I was doing as I did about chasing chasing the dream of being a, a tour player. But Bill, Bill instilled that passion in me. So today, to answer your question, uh, anybody at any level, and I, I still coach some tour players today, and I, I, I certainly coach a lot of really fine junior and college players, and and I got to be honest with you, it's still fun for me to teach the absolute ranked beginner uh, and give them the very first golf lesson and, and watch them hit that first shot up in the air uh, in the middle of the club face down the fairway. That excites me as much as it does to, uh, to have a tour player win the event on tour. So Bill gave me that, I think. Bill instilled that in me. Bill, Bill uh, by example, showed me that the it really doesn't matter what level the person's at. Your job is to uh, is to teach them the game uh, best you know how, uh, based on their ability level, and, and, and enjoy enjoy every step of that that journey. So it's it's fun for me to teach the actual rank beginners. It's probably still my favorite lesson. You know, and, and and some guys at my level, I think, uh, uh, feel that they're too good to go back and teach beginners how to play golf. Uh, but I don't, I don't feel that way at all. I, any, any person who comes to me, regardless of their skill level, um, I feel passionate about in, introducing them to the game and getting, making them better. Hmm. That's good. Um, I, I just thought of this question as you were talking. Uh, you know, one of, one of the things that I'm going to go ahead and say is prevalent in the sports world is for the the whether retired or done playing athlete, whether on his terms or not, they decide to be a trainer. They decide to teach the game uh, on whatever level to other people. Um, what you just described is a passion for the game. A passion. Well, not only is it a passion for the game, but it is a passion for teaching somebody else the game. Um, what? What, what advice would you give an athlete or somebody who's played on, on a somewhat of a higher level who wants to start to um, possibly do what you're doing or open up their own training, um, whether it's an academy or, or, or business or whatever? What's one thing that they should be very aware of as they start to do it? David, you talk about a, someone who's a, uh, who's a tournament golfer wanting to transition to teaching? Uh, somebody who's somebody who's no longer com- competing on a regular basis, but they want to they want to teach, they want to you know they want to train, they want to train others who who want to be competitive. You know, it's, uh, the first thing I tell them is it's not an easy transition. I mean, because you to walk away from uh, walk away from your dream, which is something I did at one point in my life, playing the game at a very high level. Um, First of all, that's a very tough pill to swallow. And you, you find wake up with the angel, listen, I, I'm not good enough. I'm just not good enough to play at that level. Um, I'm able to now. So that, that's, a, that's not an easy thing to do. But if they do do that and they decide they want to play in the game and the teaching coach, the next thing I have to understand is that because they played the game at a very high level, it doesn't necessarily mean they can teach it at a high level. Because it takes a special, uh, a special person and a special communicator to be able to, you know, transcend into the teach coach mode. Um, and one of the one of the mistakes that a lot of players make is that golf is such an individual game in so many ways. I mean if you look at the PGA tour and you watch Jim Furyk swing the golf club and Tiger Woods swing the golf club and, and Fred Couple swing the golf club and Dustin Johnson swing the golf club, those are all very different moves and different motions. So what a lot of players do in the, in making a mistake is they try to teach what works for them. And we have Mrs. Smith on the lesson tee who's coming to the game for the first time at uh, 53 years old and she wasn't a very athletic little girl. And you gotta get her to swing a golf club and make a contact and enjoy the game. Uh, wouldn't necessarily work for you as a player isn't the same, isn't the same thing. So you've gotta be, 
you can have a pretty deep reservoir of information, styles, and ways to approach many different uh, people, different motor skill sets, uh, different genders, you know, different IQs, different hand eye coordination, different sources of dexterity, different balances, uh, you know, different athletic types. You've got to be pretty versed in a pretty deep arsenal of information and a great set of eyes um, and a lot of patience to be able to teach all the different people that are going to work on your lesson to you. So it's not that easy. So I would tell that person that you really need to have a mentor who is uh, fairly successful at what they do and spend some time and be willing to you know, get in the trenches and get your hands dirty. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. Mm. Um. What? Obviously, you. I mean, you started playing uh, on the tour, um, or when you were playing competitive in the in the eighties. Um, you transitioned to uh, being a, a teacher, a, a trainer. Um, in the nineties. In the nineties, sorry. <laughs> uh, and now you're at a place where you've seen golf go from a. Uh, let's just say a peripheral. I mean, not not no disrespect, but a, a peripheral sport, a peripheral at least uh, topic of conversation in the sports world, to being very very much uh, you know on the on the daily rounds uh, or at least weekly rounds. Um, what is that like? What, I mean, what is that like? I mean, now nowadays we see. I mean, we have the Golf Channel. You know, when you were when you were learning and and and. Uh, building your love for golf, you didn't have that. I mean, speak on that for a little bit. I think there's been four rock stars uh, in the last um, two, the last two generations that have changed golf, and, and it was a gradual change. And the first two rock stars started, and the last two rock stars kind of put this put, put it over the top. And I think uh, if you went with Mr. Arnold Palmer first, and then it was Sidney Ballesteros, and then you kind of got that we were really going hard. And then you come along comes Fred Cup and Tiger Woods. Uh, and I think in the last two, one of the last two is a dear friend of mine, and the other one is a guy that I'm supposed to be working with. Uh, certain people come along with certain generations in sport. They have this charisma, they have this swagger, they have something about them that just sets them apart and attracts the masses. gradual progression of people that come along and have just attracted people um, to them. And then and then you know Tiger came along, you know, and and made golf cool to the masses and, and again with no disrespect as you said to to uh, the African American population in this country, to the Asian population, to the average guy who is the working guy who brought about this kitchen talk and he grew up in a public golf course uh, and, and, and built through the color barrier in a big way. I think it was a very important time for golf, uh, a great time for golf. And, and, and Freddie and Tiger were laughing for those years. Um, it was like having a video of one of the stones hot at the same time. Uh, it was just a guy. Now, you know, now in my lesson to you, when I used to get the kid who really is uh, not able to play team school, was not able to uh, sit in uh, socially in some ways, now I've got the kid coming to me on the lesson to who could have been the high school quarterback, could have been point guard on the really basketball team, could have been the lacrosse player, but he chose golf uh, because golf is cool now. So I'm seeing some athletes come to my team now that are just, you know, swing golf clubs. But a bigger, stronger, faster, smarter, uh, and harder workers than, than, than we did before. And we just 
you know, you just jump the score you know, on multiple levels in a very short period of time because those gentlemen were so cool and they made golf mainstream. Hmm. So, uh, to go along with that, where where do you see the future of golf? Um, do, you, do you see it continuing on this path that it's on right now with... Uh, I don't want to necessarily be lazy and call it a youth movement because that's I think that's really lazy. But uh, just a different, more um, let's just say you you talked about four rock stars. Is it is it becoming more of a a pop a pop generation, if you will, with golf? No, I think there's actually some danger things too. I think that, uh, as much as golf's had these people in the last all the you know, going back to our all the last forty years. We're in a dangerous, dangerous crossroads right now where um, we, we might cut up our own head, you know, despite our own faith. And I, and I say that in a very um, uh, saddened way. I think that uh, we have a lot of problems in the game now. So we have, we have access problems, we have, uh, we have you know, cost problems, financial cost problems, and are prohibited in some way. We have equipment problems in terms of Cost that's prohibitive in some ways. Uh, and as, as much as certain organizations try to do things to attract people, uh, whether it be the first team program, which has been wonderful, or other plants and situations to get finished to the youth into the game, or, and I can speak on it for hours. Um, I think the United States Golf Association, uh, uh, my own PGA of America, the PGA Tour, I think there's a lot of, um, Behind the scenes groveling and infighting going on there. Uh, as much as certain programs have been laid out to help people into the game, if you look at the game statistically, it's not growing right now. It's, it's, it's become stagnant and even, we're even losing players right now. And I think that, uh, you know, I mean, for example, the USGA's recent ban on anchored putting, which, uh, I understand the premise of, of the rule. But I don't agree with it either in that it's, it's gonna, it's gonna drive some people away from the game the kind of the way they cut the ball and make it easier for them to play the game and more enjoyable. Uh, again, I think it's a, it's a rule that you gotta climb up and use despite your face. Um, I think they have to understand that the game has changed and, and, and the world has changed and, uh, the body has changed. We need ways to bring people to the game rather than the way. And create access and avenues for people who um, can't necessarily afford the game access the feed into the game. Uh, from, uh, I'm not saying I have all the answers. Just saying we, uh, I think we, right now we're, we're at a very critical juncture. Hmm. That's, uh, those are those are very very uh, sage words there. Um, so. I mean, this, this has been cool. Uh, what now? What are you, what are some of your future goals? You've been doing this for a while since the early '90s, mid '90s. Yeah. What now? It's it's funny. It's it's, uh, it's 35 years uh, last year, and I figured out that I passed about 50,000 lesson hours last year. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be 55 this year. I've got I've got a 40 year old son, old wife, and. Uh, and, I, and I, I don't see myself stopping what I'm doing. Maybe I, I see transitioning to uh, into, into some other things, and one of them would be mentoring. Um, I think it's just a game for another uh, five to ten years. Uh, I like to still continue to see my business grow. Um, but I'd like to, I would love to, I have things across my mind like coaching a college team, things across my mind like uh, consulting. Uh, to younger players and younger teachers. Um, I, I, I enjoy just writing. I enjoy that. Uh, I enjoy things like this. I'm doing right now. Um, I've got a, I've got a lot of uh, irons in the fire. Um, but still, my, the, the best part of my time day to day is teaching uh, the club member and the average player. I, I still enjoy doing that. So, so many things have come come down the pipe and have been helpful to me in the past, but there was no plan, it just appeared, you know. I think the harder we try to plan, the more sensibility of the way. So, 
So I've, yeah. I've, if anything, I've learned just kind of take, get on top of the wave and ride it and let's see where it ends up. You know, it, it's been fun. But, you know, I'm not really sure. I, if you're guessing where I'm going to be 10 years from now, I probably couldn't give you a great guess at all. Um, you know, I've learned that uh, if nothing else, just enjoy the journey and uh, I've been pretty blessed. Well, uh, you mentioned it earlier about some of the places online to find you. Uh, what's the best place to, <laughs> to reach you online of, of the many? The easiest place is on my website, probably, which is www.tompatry.com. Uh, that's probably the easiest way, but uh, you know, people reach me by uh, email, tpatry.com. Uh, that's, that's also via my website. And, uh, they can also uh, they can also call me at my home office, which is two nine four zero four seven seven nine zero. Um, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Subscribe to the newsletter via the website as well. Um, so I'm I'm available on different ways, and uh, I'm always happy to meet new people and uh, have new conversations. That's awesome. Well, Tom, I just want to thank you for doing this interview again. David, it's a pleasure. People like you getting word out about uh, you know, a variety of sports and things that go on out there that make the uh, make the world like this so so intriguing and so much fun. And uh, I thank you for having me on. All right, no problem. Thank you all for being a part of it.